All right, guys. Uh, we're coming off of what might be one of the worst losses in all Auburn sports history. Like we can debate that later on exactly what it is. Uh, we plan on doing a, a postseason wrap. And uh, Matt texted me after the game when I was commuting back that uh, do you even want to do this one? Do we just want to wait a week or two and do like a big season wrap kind of thing? And we still want to do that. But I think we owe it to everyone that's listened all year to hash this out a bit because I think you all will probably be just as much flabbergasted as us and like confused and sad and you kind of need like a therapy session a little bit to kind of talk through this I personally that's part of why I wanted to do the podcast is because I kind of need to like talk this through a bit I mean it was brutal we lost uh, by 18 points to Miami 10 seed Miami in the second round and for with, with a team that was supposed to be like a golden team you know and in this day and age of transfers and one and dones and everything you know you might have one every year you never know or you might not you'll, you're definitely not going to see this combination of players again there's no florida teams from back in like 06 08 07 whatever it was where they brought everybody back it's just not going to happen anymore and even that team that brought right back in this day and age would have had some transfers in the bottom part so this this combination of players you're never going to see again and it's it's sad to go out the way they did we're going to avoid kind of talking about legacies and like the whole season and what this, like how this impacts the whole season as much as we can and try to give ourselves a little more space to kind of like, you know, history is tough. The closer you are to it, the more like it gets a little wonky. So it helped even in the last hour, me commuting from the bar to hear, man, the takes I was going to come on with <laughs> immediately after the game. And we've had so many close games we end up winning this year where I had some brutal takes and then I had to reverse them because we won this one, man, the game dragged really far out the end there where there was, I was just sitting at the bar thinking of all the things I wanted to say to this audience and to talk to Matt about. And it's just brutal. You know, I'm ranting right now, but Matt just, I don't know. I don't know where to take us from like a, there's no MVP to do. There's no, like, we're just going to talk guys. We're just going to talk. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think we do. I think our pregame notes were really on. So we'll talk about those. We'll talk about the players. Um, you know, it, I've watched parts of every single March Madness game this weekend. And the, the thought I had going into this year, you know, I think we have to contextualize a little bit. We're going to talk about this game, but this is really the second Auburn basketball team ever to have meaningful expectations in the NCAA tournament, to, to, to think you have a chance to go pretty deep. Um, the 1999 team was a one seed that lost in the sweet 16. And that's what they're kind of remembered a little bit. And my fear with this is just seeing all the chaos, you know, Kentucky loses St. Peter's Tennessee loses. I'm more concerned. I'm not as surprised that we lost. I, I don't think it's the worst. I'm more concerned about the way we lost and how we look the way we lost was unexpected yes. in my head. This is not like lots yeah. of people, including ourselves, said we are vulnerable. We are in a vulnerable two seed. We like did, we did not right. end the year on like this big, like great, like Tennessee ended the year on a very hot streak. And a lot of people want to pick them. Well, they went down too. Thank God. Thank God these SEC teams <laughs> went down. Thank God. But we came out and a skid and the skid was the guards. The guards were having issues. They were too small. They were turning the ball over. They were shooting too much. They couldn't get our guys the ball. The guys that were – our stars were peaking. Jabari was having amazing games. Walker was looking great. I mean, sure, he had a little injury here there, whatever, but he looked great. And we just haven't had a game all year, I don't think, where you could lay it so squarely on Jabari and Walker. Yep. There's been games that Jabari wasn't perfect. There's games that Walker had foul trouble. But we have not had a game all – we've watched – how many games did we play this year? 28 plus 6. What is that, 34? Mm-hmm. 34 games this year, 33 of them before this did not have this combination of Jabari and Walker playing this badly. We just got to see an Auburn team, what it could be next year. If Walker and Jabari, like they're not coming back. They're not walking through that door. If this team doesn't replace them with some sort of big transfers or something, that's what it's going to look like out there. Like, well, I just want to point out, I saw a guy play at power forward uh, who 
was by far our best player on the floor tonight who will be there. But look, the, here's the, that's the thing about March, right? Is you're, you're absolutely right. Something happened that hadn't happened all year um, with those front court players. It, you know, we, I talked about it in one of my pregame notes. This was the game for the front court. Like I was just praying our guards could kind of play close to even with their guards. And I don't think they quite did that, but they, the guards, our guards weren't the problem. You know, our, our problem was Walker Kessler early foul trouble, but I was using the foul trouble as an excuse. But then when Walker was on the floor, Miami completely neutralized him. I mean, he was not a factor at all. Bruce had to choose to not play him down the stretch because Jalen in the small ball lineup was better. And then Jabari, man, like, and really our whole team, right, missing layups, missing close shots. They, they got tight. Um, it's easy to not get tight when you're down early to Jacksonville State. This game felt different because that Miami team did the Bruce Pearl Auburn thing to us. And it was clear very early on that they were going to get every loose ball, that they were going to wreak havoc defensively. They were going to force turnovers. They were going to get out and run. Have you ever in your life imagined a Bruce Pearl team? At one point, it was 24 nothing fast break points, and we had zero. We, we absolutely cracked under the pressure. Absolutely. Like it wasn't at the very beginning of the game necessarily, but when things started going wrong, we absolutely cracked. Like you could even say, you, you might not know the moment it necessarily cracked. Like maybe, I mean, early on with the turnovers were really bad when we came in saying that was the one thing we couldn't do. And we turned it over almost every possession. And then they hit a lot of stuff in our face, like Jack State did, but it was okay. You know, so that wasn't necessarily when it cracked. You could say when it was Walker picking up two early fouls. Well, not that's not necessarily when it cracked, but it was each one of these was this little bit of like like a wedge in between a log that's starting to go a little bit. And then when Jabari just couldn't hit a shot to save his life, another little bit of a crack. And then probably the final stuff was just we couldn't hit a freaking layup. We mm-hmm. missed every layup out there, every little floater, every little thing around the rim. But then it almost avalanched worse because I think the pressure started getting to them that we were missing every layup. Yep. We were missing every one of those. We Jabari is missing every shot. We better, somebody else better shoot something. Somebody else better react. And it just cracked down the line until we completely split in two, you know, and that I've never seen. We have, especially not this year, maybe in a different year, the absolutely brutal last five minutes of this game were just, we were mentally broken. And it was just so sad to see from a team that's done so well in so many aspects this year. It's hard. It's hard to watch. It's like, like have like a dog getting hit by a car and then just limping its way to death instead of being like put out of its misery. Like it was super sad. <laughs> not, not good. Um, it, it, and look, it, this happens. Um, I think you you never think it's going to happen to your group and your your kids, especially when they've played this well all year and they've been through the grinder of a difficult conference season. And, you know, um, but yeah, uh, they, they, they clearly got tight. You know, they got away with a lot of stuff in the first half. How many times this year have we said, oh, my gosh, how's Auburn down one? How's Auburn down four? They had, and then they always had that second half where they – adjusted and, and and right out of the gate in the second half man Miami just laid it on us got the lead back up to nine or ten and really Auburn could never make a meaningful run and you know I think you and I probably differ on some the the, the point of angst in the second half you know the offense wasn't great um my problem was I don't know I'm I'm just most flabbergasted by our defense tonight I think our defense that has it's been the thing that's carried us through scoring droughts and road difficult games and it I thought that was the one thing we could count on with this team Miami deserves a lot of credit but this this Auburn defense was uh really bad um they were not consistent getting back in transition there with the effort I'll just and and just so y'all know I'm like the guy that talks everybody off the ledge. Okay. And and so I feel like when I complain, I mean, I'm not not trying to pat myself on the back here, but when I complain about the refs, it's usually really warranted when I I don't take it lightly to say things like this, but how many times was Miami sprinting in the open court and you saw three Auburn guys not running back in an NCAA tournament game. 
like, and if you're tired, we're supposed to be the deeper team. Miami played like seven guys. We're supposed to have guys who can run. And, and so we didn't get back. How many times did we not match up with a time in a timely manner in the half court defense? How many times did we miscommunicate on switches in pick and roll defense and leave a guy wide open? Uh, how many times did we let their center take an 18 foot jump shot wide open? Maybe that was the game plan, but at some point it wasn't working. So I was just really, really just dis- almost honestly angered by a lot of the defensive effort. And I think, you know, the offense had plenty of issues too, but for a Bruce Pearl team to defend like that on that stage, and you're a big narrative guy, that was the look that, you know, nationally, a lot of people don't care about our season, right? That was the game that they saw. And that, that's what really is sticking with me an hour later is that that is going to be where the narratives are brought from terrible. We've seen how terrible they are from the national perspective when it comes to Auburn basketball. This is not going to help. Yeah. It really sucks that this is like how much, it, we, as much as we try to talk all year, the, the don't like wait to March to get into yeah. this team. Don't put all your eggs in that basket when it's like college basketball is much bigger than that. the deep like college basketball fanatic will understand like what happened and how good these players are and things happen like that. But like 95% of people in the country <laughs> will not. In fact, like the college basketball fanatic is a pretty rare animal, honestly, like it's going to be, I don't know. Man. It's a great yeah. point because did you, did you catch some of the stuff that Jim Nance and this crew was saying? They're like, wow, like we just, they had such respect for our team because they are the nerds that are into the sport yeah. year round. And they're like, wow, they're missing so many shots at the rim. Like Jabari, we, we've never seen Jabari play like this. Like, this is just weird. They kept kind of, it, it caught them off guard. So obviously it caught us off guard too, as much attention as we pay to this team. Let's talk uh, these stat lines. You know, we were going in on Walker Kessler and Jabari a little bit, and maybe like if you didn't see the stat lines yet, or, you know, anyways, Walker Kessler, two points, two fouls, two blocks, two rebounds. That's it. O of six from the field. Yep. Didn't make a shot. Zero of zero. Zero of zero of three. His two points were at the free throw line. Uh, Jabari was, I'll, I'll go the other way because it's actually the worst the other way, is uh, three of 16. We finally got one of those games where he was shooting a huge volume, and it's because he was shooting so badly. He just kept trying to shoot out of it, and we needed him to. I mean, we saw like the one other game that was probably this bad was the Missouri game and KD saved us and the defense saved us. That's this. I think that's the point Matt's making a little bit here. The defense saved us that Missouri game. We won it with scoring like 59. Well, it didn't travel <laughs> this time. We just didn't look like the, you know, that one point the announcers uh, called Miami, like a bunch of busy bees, like running around. It just felt like they were flying around everywhere, constantly around. Our guys just did not feel like that. We felt slower. We felt lower energy. We like, it's just so weird. This team really down the stretch started feeling that way. And maybe that's the pressure of this like higher C and trying to act like you've been there, not having that same motivation. You when know, you haven't like, been there, none of these guys have been there. No, yeah. 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 But Jabari's with three of 16 from the field, one of eight from three. And that one was late. Meaning I was, I told a, the guys at the bar, I was like, I'm going to be absolutely pissed. Honestly, if like in the last five minutes, we knew this game was absolutely <laughs> over. If Jabari goes and hits two or three of these like ridiculous threes at the end of the game, I'm going to be pissed. <laughs> like, I don't even want to see it. And he wouldn't hit one of them, but he didn't do this like crazy thing he's done in a couple of these games. Three, six from free throws. We were, the free throws were bad. I mean, it looks like we ended up being 73%, but it just felt like they were. Yeah, we missed some bad. big ones. We missed some really bad time. We only missed five all game. That's crazy to me. It felt like every time we needed a big free throw, we didn't hit it. I guess that's part of like when you're losing that bad and trying to come back every little point yep. matters so much. But this year, I just, I'll, I'll have to look on our postseason thing, how good our free throw percentage is. Cause it feels like all year it wasn't really great outside of like Wendell maybe, but I don't know. Those stat lines are so bad from Walker and Jabari. Like I feel like I'm bringing low energy right now, but I'm just so sad. I'm so sad about this whole thing, man. I feel for these kids. Like it was interesting when Matt asked if we wanted to do this thing or not, and we, We've just, it's been a long year. We've done so many podcasts. We've been so invested in this team. And a big part of this because we thought this team could be special. And when in those like deep SEC games, when we were kind of like, man, we're putting a lot of effort in for this show. I think in my head, at least, it was like, we're documenting this magic season and I'm yeah. not going to slow down now. And for it to end this way, it's just so brutal and kind of makes me 
the tiredness of putting together the show almost has like hit me a little bit and it's late at night too but yeah it's late eastern time uh, the, but it, it made me and i don't want to like trivialize any of the stuff they're doing but like i know the like walker kessler and Spartan, they all have to go to a press conference after this yep. and talk about this and it it's a thousand times worse for them so if i felt any like small amount of like man i put all this effort in and it just didn't work out the way i wanted to these guys were up at 6 a.m. doing early basketball with Cambridge, all these people, and like uprooting from the college they were at before. And Jabari's got one season for sure. Like, uh, it's got to be, I can't imagine the finality. That's the most, is what makes Mark Madness so fun. But it also makes it just so brutal that you can work that hard. And it all came down to this one, like, almost wacky game and i would i would be less angry and less sad if we lost in a predictable manner that right. like it just kind of was like trending this way and the guards had some trouble and we just didn't hit the threes and which some of that was true right we didn't yeah. shoot we couldn't hit shots today like some of that was accurate but i think i would have been okay losing if we looked like ourselves I just yeah. thought that was not a, an Auburn 2021-2022 basketball performance in any way. And, and on that stage, it's just really disappointing to see that that's how it ends. Because you're right. March Madness is a blight. You know why I've loved March Madness my whole life? Like, seriously, I've had so much passion and energy for it because my team was never in it. And it's yeah. fun when you're not invested in something. You're just like, hey, I just want the plucky underdog to beat that team, or I want these great games that come down to a buzzer beater. And you're right, the finality of this, like watching Tennessee, you know, I live in Tennessee and a lot of my friends and stuff are big Tennessee fans. They thought this was this was their team. Like that was their, they had that special group of guys, kind of like we had in 2019. You could just feel it a little bit towards the end. And um, to see it just go away in front of your eyes like that quickly um in a in a season where you've had 35 other opportunities it, it really is jarring and I'm sure that maybe that played into some of the uh weird I thought the last five minutes of this game were just really weird like we I know we haven't been in that position very much but like ah, it was just we were so unorganized with trapping and like trying to force turnovers but it was very lethargic and it it just looked very I was hoping we'd start pressing Bad. a lot earlier there, like about halfway through the second, I was calling for like, screw yeah. it. Did you see what Baylor did to North Carolina? Just start pressing, start doing like change it up. But we, we tried a bunch of, that was the other weird thing. We tried a lot of things this game. We played a ton of that small ball. We had like, we tried things. We really did. I don't feel like we didn't like, like it almost went, yeah, it almost went so far that it was like, you almost wish we could have just stuck it out with our team that we had the whole time and our starting line. We had the whole time because it felt like we went away from that trying to like adjust, you know? Well, but we did. I mean, I, I think we tried. Both but... halves, right? Like I was, I think I texted you and maybe some other people too. Like we started with our starting line, but Kessler got in trouble. And then outside of just Kessler got in trouble, we kind of realized the small ball was working better against them. And then I, I half to, I was like, do you come out and try to reestablish your game? Or do you just like go straight up small ball? And I think everyone agreed, including Bruce, we tried to reestablish and it just did not work out. They started on a 9-0 run, I believe, to yep. start the second half also. They just boomed us, man. It just hurts. It hurts. It's so weird. And no one outside of our fan base is going to understand how weird this game was. And this was very, like, I'm not going to call it fluky, but, like, it just hasn't happened. And so don't, like, these these probably these smug other SEC fans or whoever else are going to be like, yeah, we knew they were vulnerable. We knew they were whatever we knew like i've had him going out early in my bracket because of whatever but this is not the reason why like the reason you thought why is not what happened in the game you know the the more concerning pieces for me were just okay am i am i overreacting to i just i gotta be honest i i, I thought there were just so many points in this game. I'm not saying the whole game. I, I don't think we showed up not ready to play. I, I hate those lazy narratives like, oh, like Auburn just didn't. They thought they were just going to show up and beat Miami. I don't think anybody thought that. We didn't hit shots. Our alpha couldn't score. But, man, didn't it feel like – I've watched all these games, and like you, you mentioned Baylor, North Carolina. Like, down 25 with 11 minutes to go. The, the way Baylor played – versus the way we played in the last 10 minutes of this game left me feeling very, 
frustrated. Um, and again, I don't want to, you know, it just, look, when we pressed, like you called for the press, we pressed some, we weren't, it wasn't a meaningful intentional press. Didn't it feel like no. that? Like we didn't no. have guys in the we, right we did spot. Like, we did like one or two where we like lined up like we were going to do it. And then like immediately fell back when the guy didn't like. And there's always really somebody open. Track them. So, yeah. and, and look, part of that's Miami's four guard lineup. You know, they have a bunch of ball handlers. They only had three turnovers the whole game against USC. They only had four this whole game against us. Um, they do a great job taking care of the ball. Maybe that's part of the reason Bruce didn't. But it just, at some point you got to fight. And uh, I, I did not like the fight from our group in the second half. I'll, I'll be honest about that. I did not think it was um, up to the standard of this stage and where this team was. It's, it is weird. The, the energy just – we haven't seen energy like that all year maybe. Maybe once or twice where they we just got so outworked by the other team. And so the energy uh, – we haven't seen it. I mean, that's why I brought up right at the beginning that this is like the worst loss in – maybe Auburn sports history, in my opinion, one of them, at least we'll talk about it. I think we should really have a, a, a debate about it in the actual end of season. Yeah. We have a little more perspective and we'll maybe we'll take off the, uh, the usual F word thing and bring up some of those stuff in there. Uh, we'll have a section for that, but it just, the, we saw it down the stretch when we were the number one team finally got, it. we were like this underdog, like blue car, go get them until we got number one. And then we fell at number one. That's fine. We still brought some energy, but it felt like down the stretch, man, we just brought this weird, like lazy lion kind of like energy where we just didn't think we quite needed to like scrap as hard as we needed to. It felt like, I don't know if like that's a good analogy or not, but I don't know. <laughs> we're so, I, we usually have a lot of conversation of where to go with the conversation. I'm just so upset. It's tough to well, know where else I even want to talk about. A you know? couple things specifically. Okay. Um, we didn't shoot well. We, we, we missed layup. We shot 30%. It was, it was kind of a and game again in terms of the, the consistency of making shots, 19% from three. Free throws again, we, we, we hit 74%. But, man, every one of the five we missed were pivotal, kind of like you said, trying to come from behind. Um, turnovers, 13 to four. I, I said we needed to be 12 to 14 or under. We did that, but we had eight in the first – 12 minutes. Yeah, that I, was really... texting, I was texting Matt and guest to, former guest host Ben Young about the turnovers because I was so such a thing that I had in my notes and I think everyone knew, we talked about the podcast, how big of a deal this turnover thing was that USC beat them in pretty much every stat line except for turnovers. And to start as bad as we did, it was almost, it was like, it, it felt almost every possession was a turnover. I mean, I was just one, two, three, four, I was texting all of them. It was three, it was three turnovers in the first before the first time out for the first, like whatever. I don't know. It was just, it, it was it brutal. Set, it set the tone, didn't it? Yeah, I mean, it really yeah. did. It, it put you in this place where I think the lack of confidence and the lack of swagger kind of started, you really started to feel it. Uh, let me just run down these last couple. Uh, you know, the only thing we did well was the bench. I'm going to reverse this. We talk about how good the bench is. Well, how about our starters? Our starters got outscored tonight, 75 to 33. They got more than doubled up by Miami start. Part of that is because playing seven, you said the other team played seven, which was even generous. They really there. played six. They played really six because they played seven minutes. And I don't even know if that was like late in the game or what. They played one, they played two bench guys, one for 10 minutes and one for seven minutes. And one of their four, which is probably the very end, but like for seven. Okay. They probably played six guys, really. And so just absolutely brutal that they outran us and. Yeah. yeah. Did it not feel like they, it's just all year we've talked about like, we're supposed to be the team that has the energy that has the depth. We can go for two minutes and take a break, get out. You know, I was confused why Kessler was even in when he got his second foul. Cause we usually take him out two and a half, three minutes in and it was past, it was four and a half in and then Cardwell wasn't at the scorer's table yet. That was weird. Um, points in the paint. How about this? 48 to 28 to Miami. So they, they played small and they punked us inside and got to the rim at will 30 to one fast break points. I mean, that, that, I don't know if I've ever seen that. A big part um, of that is, you know, we, we, thir 13 turnovers was actually kind of surprisingly low for how brutal yeah. it was to start the game and how much of it set the tone and how we ended up playing small ball partially because of that, partially because of Kessler went out and partially because we were afraid of whatever was going on. We tried to change things up. So but what does that take? Do it. 
I was going to say, what does that tell you? Because you're right. They probably only got about half of those fast break points off of the turnovers. So what yeah. that tells me is we were getting run up our butt by them off makes, off misses. They were getting eat, they were getting points in transition, not just when we turned it over, but just in the flow of the game. And that's the, the, the hidden points that just drive me crazy. And the times where we had all day to get back and match up with somebody. We played man pretty much the whole game, maybe a little bit of zone. It's just, you can't do it. it you know, there were just constant miscommunications on the defensive end. And again, that's not who this team was. This team was an elite. It worked at some point team. though, right? We haven't run people off the court in a long time. Like yeah. but LSU game, like feels like the last definitive one where we did that really, you but, know? But when's the last team that scored like this against us? Oh, none. We usually, our half court defense has been amazing. Yeah. But it's amazing all year too. Like, I don't that, know. That's inexcusable. I mean, 30 to one fast break points is just completely unacceptable. 10 to one steals, Jackson. 10 <laughs> steals for them, one steal for us. And the turnovers tell that story. The steals tell that story. And I'm sorry. You just, you can't tell me that this team, as good defensively as they were in the half court all year, I just, to me, you could, Miami deserves so much credit for their scheme and what they do. They're very impressive. I was worried after I watched them play USC, but you just can't – I can't reconcile these numbers and say that our guys were 100% bought in on the defensive end. Now, I don't know why, and I don't know how you get to that point, at this, you know, in this kind of game. Uh, just those numbers don't make sense for who this team was all year. And then on the other side – they only turned the ball over four times. So you yep. talk about the fast break difference points, like they went and scored on us, but then we couldn't turn the ball over to them. And that's, again, yep. goes back to the defense. The defense wasn't like right. getting them confused. The defense wasn't getting them sped up or any kind of like uncomfortability. So, and then when on fast breaks, you're not going to turn the ball over as much either. So I don't know, man, 13 to four. I mean, clearly they figured something out. I mean, they did this to USC also on like yep. the turnovers and like them not having any turnovers too. So it's not like we are the only ones that didn't turn them over, but it's just brutal. I think maybe we could, could go through some pregame notes, maybe, you know, yep. with some stats and we'll go through each player. Maybe not that we have to like really harp on each one. I mean, two <laughs> biggest ones we've talked about. So we'll go through your notes real quick. Uh, Miami thrives. You know, one last thing before I do the notes, actually one last one. Uh, suppose that they have a lot of seniors on this Miami yes. team, like fifth year seniors, even. And, you know, we had some freshmen, and maybe you, you know, Calipari's had to deal with this one and done thing. And he like mm -hmm. thrived in the one and done early, and he hasn't done much since. I mean, this 15 seed loss to the Peacocks, St. Peter's, is kind of like underlined this Calipari narrative that maybe the like whole one and done thing was his thing. And now he's past that point or whatever. Their fans are pissed at him. And yeah. Now, the, the irony is this is his oldest team he's had it since like for 10 years probably yeah and so then you have this new era of nils and uh transfers and stuff we thought maybe we had like jumped on it early and man look at what we did with walker kessler and kd and all these people on this thing and you know maybe we're learning that like the team that won the final four was a bunch of older players that have been around you know and now you, you get punked by a, a team like miami like so now you got to wonder like what is the right setup for a team if you really care about March? You know, clearly we won the regular season, so like it's we we're doing pretty good, but like you just wonder if how much that plays into it. So you had notes, you had yeah, thoughts no, on seniors. No, I I mean that's a, I'm glad you said that because that is a huge piece of this. That you know, Auburn is not necessarily super young because of all the transfers, but they're young in experience in this moment. None of them had played in the tournament except for Walker sparingly last year for briefly. So like this was a new thing for them. A lot of the guys at Miami have at least been in it around it. They've been around the ACC. Um, are you, are, it, probably, I don't know for sure, but playing with each other for a couple of years too. Exactly. You know? um, and, and that I think showed up. I think, I think there is a, uh, and especially look, I, I do want us to be realistic. And, and understand like like we've gushed about Jabari all year Jabari is we will never see another guy like him it's been awesome to have him on our team we've never had that guy and we had him it's just it shows you how vulnerable this whole March thing is because all it takes is one game from your guy and and history is littered with great players that just 
And like you mentioned, Kentucky, that's a great comp. Like Duke hadn't been there in a long time to the final four. Um, it, it's hard. And, and I think you're right. I think Bruce and his staff have done a great job of adjusting to all the changing narr- landscape of the sport, but obviously, you know, you don't want to over, you're not going to be turning down uh, Jabari Smith, you know, I don't think anytime soon if a kid like that wants to come to your school. Cause I think I'm sure Bruce is going to handle this loss. Great. He's good with the players and like, you know, he'll take the brunt of it, I'm sure. And he'll, he, he'll have his guys back and that'll go a long way with recruiting. They always, he always does that, but I don't know. I'm right. We'll, we'll, we'll talk more about the whole big thing, but it's got to yeah. be exhausting. I'm sure. Like when you see that final zero and the work you put into this. Oh yeah. You sign that lifetime contract kind of, or whatever it is, 10 more years, whatever. There's just gotta be, there's going to have to be an exhaustion level of like, yep. You put in that much work, you know, anyways, we'll do uh, notes here. One Miami thrives off of it, forcing turnovers and scoring off of them. Auburn needs to stay at 10 or 12 to 14 turnovers or less. Can Auburn win the category? No. Um, yeah, everything we just talked about. I, I, our number was okay, considering how bad it was to start, but the start went a long way to determining the results of the game, I think. So, yeah, it was a big problem. And I think bigger, bigger, why I threw that last little caveat in there is like, can Auburn have any chance of winning turnovers? Because to me, that was a big thing. If we, if we could neutralize their guards a little bit and their turnovers, I thought we had a really good chance to win. And obviously when you get a uh, beat 30 to one in fast break and 13 to four in turnovers you know we've talked about all year when this team wins rebounding and turnovers they're hard to beat and uh, they were a lot easier to beat tonight because they gave Miami a lot of extra possessions your next one is uh can can Auburn get Jabari and Walker enough shots offensively I'm not sure Miami has the personnel to guard them consistently apparently they did um I don't know if it's Miami's personnel we got Jabari shots Walker obviously got in foul trouble but man it just felt like especially Walker, man, so many around the rim. I feel like all his six shots were right there and he's finished those all year. And we've gushed about how he's gotten so much better offensively and building confidence. And do we want to go to him more? Do we want to throw it in the post more? And it just, just a really rough game. game. His offensive game had gotten so much better and he just missed it. He had like a drive down the lane that like you thought maybe he had gotten to that point where he could make something like that, even though it was kind of an aggressive drive, you know? Both like shout out to Miami to an extent, man, because there was I think both Walker and Jabari had got blocked epically yeah. tonight. Yeah. Jabari, the same kind of dunk that he went against Jack State. He did against my or he was a similar kind of thing where he was gonna dunk on a guy. I thought for sure he was about to posterize a guy, completely blocked by the guy. Yep. I and then I think I don't know if it was the same guy that's holding his hand after. I was like, did he like did Jabari like break this dude's hand while he tried to block it? And then I think Walker, too, got blocked pretty bad once. And there was one possession, I believe, where both Walker and Jabari got blocked in the same possession going up into it. So I just – it was brutal. I mean, part of it's on them, part of it's on us. I don't, we definitely got the volume for Jabari. So the last one is, are Auburn's guards up to the task of keeping Miami's guards in front of them defensively? Uh, no, they were not. Um, I, you know, look, I, they weren't. Awful. I, I, but I think the thing that's been cool about our defense all year is that when our guards get beat, we have great help defense, right? And like our bigs are waiting for them and they swat the ball and they, it allows the guards to play aggressively. But man, like even Zep, right? Zep didn't make any big time defensive plays. I did think Zep kept the, his guy in front of him. Um, and, and when I honestly didn't think our guards were that bad, although I'm, I'm rethinking that with the uh, points in the paint. When you give up 48 points in the paint to a small team, and the bigger picture, right? If you're Miami and you get to play small with that many ball handlers on the floor and you're not getting punished on rebounding and points in the paint, that's like a win all day. You'll play, everybody would play small if you could just do that all the time. Yeah. But it's not that easy. I mean, Auburn won rebounding, but it was – not a dominant rebounding win at all. Um, the guards were okay. I, Miami's guards won the matchup, but I don't think Auburn lost because of our guards. I thought I thought KD at one point, you know, we've gone down the we've, we've had these conversations about when one thing doesn't go right, we have several like answers kind of, and we thought at one point maybe this is like that Missouri game and KD's just gonna like have to turn it on, and he was the only one really he did. that like do it. <laughs> He did. I yeah, mean, there was there was a little spot like halfway through the second where we were really starting to dwindle that it looks like 
we could not seem, we went down the A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L options. And KD went and got a couple tough twos and hit a three. And I thought, man, like, I was like telling people there, like, this would be a really good time for a KD Hamburglar moment. Like, just get this people pumped up. The crowd is majority Auburn. Like, let's get the energy back up. Like, we have to do it now. He tried his best and it just, it didn't work out. He couldn't get the Hamburglar thing. The defense just never got smothering. There's the same time that I was like, why are we not completely just selling out on the press right now? Like, they pay, made us pay when we did even like pretend like we were going to. So I don't know, but shout oh. out to KD for that. You know? Yeah. yeah no, I, I thought KD was the guy who brought, I thought Jalen Williams, uh, which credit to him for everything he's been through in the last 48 hours, Jalen played terrific uh, in the first half. He kind of kept us alive with 10, I think first half points. Um, KD, I thought did his thing in the second half. He made some plays. He got some rebounds. He hit some tough shots. He was willing to take some tough shots. He felt like, the guy that was kind of, and honestly, he ended up leading the team in scoring and only took 10 shots. So like KD, KD was good. Um, it just, I just didn't. And, and I wasn't as hard on Wendell as I think some people were. I, I was being pretty hard on Wendell. I think we're going to have to have a, I think yeah. it'll be interesting in our, our postseason uh, conversation. I think we'll have a whole section on the future <laughs> of Wendell Green and this team and what, you know, anyways, we'll get in. I think that'll be good conversation yep. for later we'll get into it a little bit in a bit when we go through the stats but i think there'll be a good long conversation for that and this is a good time to bring up my note yeah can the bench and three position continue to contribute against a major level team and you brought they, up they Jane. did they and did I, wanna, I just want to take a section here in the sad sad depressing podcast to give Jalen williams some claps can we give some claps he, man he but two teeth missing which i think he has some dental surgery to get him back if you missed that he got his two front teeth knocked out in the game before immediately went to a, a dental surgeon of some sort after the game, fixed it up, came in and thrived and looked just like he did the game before we could not hit a three to save our lives. And he hit two of them to like, keep us in the game. And it's bizarre. I guess we didn't get to talk about this too. Well, maybe we'll do that in a minute that we were only down one and a half. Yeah. It feels like we just got dominated the entire game. We were only down one and a half. We thought it would be fine. It was, I don't know, but Jalen kept us in it at times and hit some good shots, hit the threes, looked like what we kind of think Jalen could be. Mm -hmm. And it's good to see at the end of the season that he did that two games in a row in March. I mean, odd also that he did it two games in March, (laughs) but he really hasn't done it all year. Uh, Like, I don't know, man, but shout out to Jalen. I mean, our bench was keeping us in it, honestly. Like, we've just taken, like, at at halftime. The bench was what was keeping us in this thing. And yes. I just, it gives us too and, much to ask that they and, could do that. You know? I, I know this is very low bar for what our expectations were, but I, I want to give a small shout out to uh, you mentioned the three position. I mean, Flanagan and Cambridge, they had 10 points and 12 rebounds. I, I, I didn't think they were bad at all. I mean, they, we know the weaknesses. Cambridge had a, he came right out after he took a really bad three point attempt. Two games and, in a row, he's shot in really bad timing like when the team at least needed it an early shot clock contested three just brutal and i think think they weren't so they weren't so awful but they there was a really bad turnover on flanagan where he was trying to get the ball i think either uh jabari or Jalen, where he just threw it away which was also like both of them had really like not awful games altogether but the timing of when they made their mistakes was really bad that, t- that throwaway was like the fifth or sixth turnover in a time where it like felt like that was an underline of like yeah things are going badly <laughs> but, if, but if I told you if I told you before the game that we were going to get 10 points out of Flanagan in Cambridge we were going to get 12 from Jalen off the bench you you would have been like, had a great Cambridge had a great put back dunk too yeah. that was borderline uh yeah. I don't know what you call it when it's not off the cylinder but, interference yeah, it's borderline that, but he had a cool dunk with that one, so that was nice to see. And Flanagan, I thought for sure, was going to get a charge or two when he kind of stormed into the lane, and Miami <laughs> just didn't make him pay for it. I mean, I guess I've just got PTSD from watching <laughs> No, him no, I said the same thing. It. I'm like, dude, that Miami guy didn't read the scouting report. If he just yeah, two games are up. This could have ca- this could have mattered. Like, we've talked about that to these teams, that we've played these SEC teams all year, and they know our players – and like it's it was two two games in a row where Flanagan really did what he was doing all these other games. The guys just didn't set their feet, you know. Like he still annoyed me with how he was still hunting for a shot at times. 
on offense Flanagan was when I'm like, this experiment was over. So that, that'll be another convert. Well, we'll be having some interesting conversations, I think, about a lot of these players. And like, we'll probably do our the podcast maybe like the day after the national championship or something, you know, and uh, yeah. kind of talk through. Maybe we'll see if we can get a guest on or something. Just kind of talk through where we see this legacy of this team and different stuff. And we'll talk about, I think, I think there's going to be a lot more shakeup on this team than some people think. I think everybody just assumes this team is going to be everybody back except for Jabari and Walker. And we'll try to replace them with transfers. I think there's going to be some other weird stuff that happens, but uh, I mean, I guess we'll probably see by the time that podcast, by the time we do the podcast, some of this stuff will probably shake out by then. But uh, my next one is, can we play through Walker and Jabari when things get tough? Man, we really did not expect the game to go this way. We really thought it was going to be a guards issue and the front court was going to dominate this team, and that's how we're going to win the game. And it was the exact opposite. And it just – I have no more thoughts on that question. <laughs> it didn't work out at all. Yeah. This, the idea behind that didn't even work out. And you credit credit Miami again. Like, I, I think they did a good job of neutralizing them in some – although, look, we missed short shots. We missed a lot of easy looks. Um, but especially I thought the way they attacked on offense was interesting. Um, Kessler has looked so comfortable guarding perimeter guys. And I don't know if he's just the, the injuries or what, but he just, he looked a lot more hesitant outside today for some reason, it seemed to me like he wasn't able to just really be up on that guy. Maybe that was, again, maybe that was the game plan. They wanted that forward to shoot the 18 foot two pointer, you know, the long, they hit a lot of, they hit some tough shots early they on. Did. Just compounded later and we couldn't hit anything and we couldn't get the ball turned over and we were turning the ball over. Uh, another another interesting thing we could say is Jabari, we like hounded on this or talked about this, that his last bit of development was needing to like, if you're going to be the dude and you have an off night, you got to go to the rim and get some foul calls and get some tough twos. And that's kind of how you continue to be that guy. And it's not like he didn't try that. In fact, he got some tough twos in the first half and stuff. And I was praising him for being like, yeah, your shot's off in the first half. But you went and got some tough twos. You went and hit a couple free throws. Like, good for you. Like, that's the part of the game you had to develop. It just, like, he he can't do it for a full game, honestly. He's just not there yet. And I was praising him for that. But then his shot was still so bad in the second half that it just wasn't going to matter, you know. My, yeah. my last note is, can we be the ones that force the chaos and capitalize on it? Absolutely not. It was brutal. It was exactly what I was afraid of, that they'd be the ones that kind of buzzing around and creating the chaos. And then because they're the ones that created the chaos, they're thriving on it and and finishing the ball. I wanted to be the other way. Like I almost made my note, like, can we speed the game up and cause a lot of turnovers? But then like, that, like incentivize it, maybe either team could thrive in it. Not only did like they sped us up, we didn't speed them up at all. (laughs) They turned us over. We didn't turn them over at all. They capitalized. We didn't. Like exact nightmare scenario. I, I think I, my, I said to somebody this tonight before the game started, I said, doesn't it worry you just a little like, it just doesn't feel like this team thrived in the chaos as much as other Bruce Pearl teams. Like, you know, that that's kind of always our thing. We want to muck the game up and make it a little ugly and up and down. And I guess maybe just having two big guys that are so good. We just never seem to be that team this year. I know we had, some good chaos moments in that 19 game winning streak. But I've grown to believe that that was a function of everything, the momentum, everything was good. You know, everything was flowing and we were able to do okay in those situations. It seems like lately, every time the loose ball, the ball's loose out there, I'm just not confident we're going to get it or make a play with how many times did you see, we had these opportunities today where we got out on a break or we got a, a, a loose ball and then we can't do anything with it. And then it's going right back the other way, you know, at our basket. And I don't know. It's weird. Like I was going to say that maybe it's like our guards are not good finishers. Uh, uh, you know, the Wendells, the Zepps are not those two, at least for sure. Are not good finishers at the rim. In fact, well, Wendell, he's done some great ball. moves and finish at the honestly. They're just not tough finishers. Not going to finish through contact. The only, and then KD has done that at times, but he's had a lot of issues in transition, a passing or B like doing this weird thing where he picks up the foul, but doesn't actually finish the two and then gets one free throw. And just like, it's like automatic that he's going to do that pretty much. And like, he's dunked it like one time this year, I think. And everybody was like, cool, he can dunk. <laughs> like, I wish he would do that more in transition, but I don't know. And then we had Alan Flanagan, who should be the guy that finishes through contact, but really what he did all year was catch charges instead, <laughs> you know? So I don't know, man, we have, yeah, I agree. We didn't thrive in the chaos. We've talked about a cold podcast. We just did not finish a lot in transition. Your all-time favorite play 
was when we were doing transition stuff and Jared passed up an open two to throw it out to Bryce for a three. That kind of attitude on the team just never happened. Like we did cause turnovers and like the Cambridge alley oops are kind of the, the closest thing we got to like that kind of attitude that we're going to turn the ball over and we're going to run and we're going to finish and we're going to do cool stuff. But like there was never that attitude of like, I'm going to toss it up to the open three guy because we're going to cause so many turnovers, so many fast breaks that this is not that important to us. Like we're just going to keep going. I think that in my head, like it was a combo. Like they were so confident in, in Bryce's three game yep. that they would toss it out there. But also they were going to do this so often they could take some risks. When we got out there, at least recently, probably the last 10 to 15 games, we were like, we better finish this in transition because we don't know how often we're going to get that. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's a great point. I th- and I think it should highlight how special that group was because that, that was weird. Like you could ask anybody, like that was a weird thing we caught fire with at the end of that season. And uh, I think- Could you imagine this team on a transition tossing oh. it out to one of our players? Over there? Oh. We would lose our minds. We were, we were we were cool with them doing that that team and they could even miss and we'd be like, that was all right, that's cool. This team, if they threw out- if Wendell or Katie threw it out to an open Jalen or Cambridge or something, I would be absolutely like boiling. You know, <laughs> that's the notes. Uh, we can go through some of these players maybe real quick and maybe not be too mean <laughs> if I can help myself. We'll try. We already, we already talked about Walker. We already talked about Jabari. We even talked about Flanagan a little bit. He had eight rebounds, five points. Uh, talked about the future of him. I'm hoping, ho, ho, hoping that, he, he's been dealing with the little injury all year or whatever. And this is not like a post injury. This is planning and kind of thing. Like it, it'll really be, I mean, he's got to be coming back next year. So you just hope that he can like either, even if it is like the speed's always going to be a little lower that he can start developing a shot or something. Otherwise there's going to be some real conversations about the three position and having to hurt some people's feelings about needing to go out to get a sharpshooter or get somebody else in that position because it's not we can't go in the next season with it being Cambridge or playing again again I feel like so mm. I don't know it just that, this didn't help that much so th- th- you're right that's the question um, I was talking to somebody about that sorry I'm very distracted by the Arizona Arizona is about to lose to TCU um, oh really they're down I mean, three with three minutes to go they've blown like a ten point lead this March Madness is nuts that, that's like the one soothing thing about our losses. We are not alone for sure. Um, so somebody was like, Hey, I think we need to bring in some taller guards. And, you know, I'm like, well, I agree, but like, you know, <laughs> we have two incoming freshmen who are pretty highly recruited. One of them's a guard, one of them's a forward or a combo guard slash. He might be your answer to chains. Westry might be your three option. Um, and we, I watched Trey Alexander play pretty well, yeah. For Creighton, yeah. which we thought, whatever, we lost that guy, whatever. He's being a, you know, whatever, but ends up he played pretty well for Creighton this year. <laughs> we probably could have used him. No, he's really good. Um, and and look, I, I, he wouldn't have probably had quite the same opportunity this year at Auburn, but he would have been a good fit for what we ended up needing, right? Um, mm. So, anyway, I, Flanagan, I mean, that's, that's the hard thing for these coaches. Um, you, I think you probably just have to bank and trust that he can be closer to the all SEC guy and, and give him, you know, the whole off season to make himself a lot of money next year. Think, He's going to be very motivated to do so. I'm sure. Yeah. We'll have to talk about more about that stuff in our post game. I think we're gonna have to go down like the list and be yeah. like, we might have to hurt some feelings. We might have to look at like, what do we, you know, just like from a fan perspective, what we think will be the thing. KD, yeah. we talked about him too. He, he tried to have his moments. He played really solidly. I can't, I really can't complain about KD in this game. You, I wanted him to go like Superman, Super Saiyan, and it just, the rest of the team was not going to help him out in that moment. You know, he wasn't right. great all game necessarily, but he did have that moment we all came to expect that could have been a, a fuse to light this team and just, there were multiple. Didn't do it. Yeah. Yeah. There were multiple in the second half where he made a couple great plays, but, you know, and you just, like you said, you kind of hope that that catches fire a little bit. You know, if you had to nitpick, Maybe he didn't have that big steal or whatever, but like he was, I thought he was probably, as far as I can remember, I don't remember him getting beat a ton. He, it got bad late with KD because I think everything kind of set in. Um, he turned it over and he, he but. It'd be, it'll be interesting to go through the narrative of some of these players from like, if we can go back and remember kind of some narratives through the season of KD and stuff. I mean, the, the like lapses on defense are gone 
And yeah. like, we don't like, we're not praising him for that anymore. They're like, oh, look, he's stopped doing that. Good job. But like, you just keep moving to the next thing and the next thing or whatever. Like he's, I don't know. Like could, I would take some lapses in those defense to get back this game. Some of the like Hamburglar stuff. Cause he kind of, we got to want to talk about the narrative of, did he lose the Hamburglar stuff because he locked in on the, like actually not giving up these open actually shots playing, and stuff, you know? So. Playing yeah. The next one's Zep, you know, typical Zep game, really. We just wish he could have stepped up more on offense. Not that that was going to be a thing that he's been doing all year necessarily. Like he had, a, a, I think, a really good open three at one point that was during a crucial time that he missed. Yeah. And I was really – there's a lot of those throughout this game because we needed those comebacks. And there was definitely moments where we could have, like, sparked a thing that felt like something. And every single time the ball seemed to go to Miami or we missed it or just nothing ever seemed to go right. No, you're, you're right. Um, you know, I, it is really going to be fascinating because Zepp is this piece that I think that we saw is very valuable. Um, but, you know, oh, well. he, he's a double digit scorer, you know, from, from last year. Can he, is there more, is there more from Zepp, a guy like Zepp next year, potentially without the star power of, of two potential lottery picks on this team. Yeah. I think that's the thing you have to keep in mind with basketball. People want to, you know, it stinks to lose good players, but like you get about the same amount of shots in a game, no matter who's playing for your team. So like the shots just move and they change and, and it's not like a, I don't want to get into next year. I just think Zepp was good. I think Zepp, you know, he was okay. Uh, he only played 17 minutes tonight um they kind of really w- rolled with Wendell I was actually really disappointed because our defense was just trash for most of the last 10 minutes of this game and Zepp wasn't out there and I was kind of like you know kind of just feel like that's the end we need to improve on to have a chance in this game and he just wasn't there till it was too late yeah I think that'll be another postseason one we'll have a real conversation about the point guard position because both of them should be coming back but should both of them come back should we do something else what should we do? like what do they have to develop so We'll get more into that for sure. And if Zep can be, if these guys can step up with those extra shots. Uh, we talked about Jalen. Great job, Jalen. We can talk about Dylan. We played the small ball a ton. So we just did not see like Kessler and, and Dylan a ton. Dylan played 12 minutes, which is actually more than he usually plays probably because he played a lot in the first half when Kessler was out. But then the second half, it was really strange to watch us play a lot of the second half with no center. And I mean, Dylan didn't play bad or anything. He actually had some really good defense at times uh, where they got left by himself down there, which is usually fine when we leave Kessler by himself down there. I was getting a little irritated that Cardwell kept getting put in weird positions. I was just really glad the refs didn't blow the whistle a bunch of times where it was like one-on-one. And when Kessler's one-on-one, I kind of get excited. When Cardwell's one-on-one like that, I'm expecting 50% of the time, probably there's going to be a whistle on it. So he didn't get those foul, like he didn't get the fouls on there, but he also just disappeared because he didn't get to play. And we're not going to expect much from an offense. So I don't know, not a lot to say, honestly, about Cardwell. It's weird. It's weird that he played 12 minutes and he has literally no, no shots, no assists, no fouls. He had one rebound in 12 minutes. Just kind of weird. It didn't feel like he was very impactful in those 12 yeah. minutes. And maybe that's how Miami was playing. Um, like you said, he made some good, you know, he had some good defensive maneuvers at the basket, but stinks for him. You know, somebody we got to talk to a few weeks ago and um, I know they had really high hopes with this group and, you know, you just hope that uh yeah hey sorry i keep going to next year because that's now like that's where it's we're tough at. it's tough I, I talked to matt before this that we wanted to like try to steer away try to talk again but i said i knew it would be really tough because all these things we've talked about these players we were always talking like well what can we approve on what can they do differently what are they going to do next game what do we need them to do but now everything's in the past tense so it's really hard to like not project to next year when so yeah. much is uncertain right now in college basketball so we'll, we'll move on to the next guy. The last guy to really talk about is uh, Wendell uh, Green, which I think we'll have a little conversation about 11 points, three fouls, three turnovers, five rebounds, four of 14, one of six. I don't know. He's, he's becoming a very controversial figure in the fan base and amongst myself even because he does things we need him to do. Yeah. We need him to be a guy that makes this team go. I think everybody knows that. And he didn't play some like – He's had a couple of games where we like want to like put it on him. Like, man, he just screwed it up. He shot too many times. But when it, it's just weird to have a game like this where Kessler and, and Jabari played so badly that like whatever window was up to pales in comparison 
Wendell could have had a god awful game. It wouldn't matter because they had such bad games themselves that like, it's just the importance is so different. Like we kind of like talk about Wendell's like importance to the team after like we, the, the Kessler Jabari thing was almost like a given. It was like, they are the most important, but after that it's Wendell. And we talk about Wendell because like Kessler and Smith are such a like, they were the default. They were there. They were always there. So like, you know, it's like we're going down the list now with Wendell, but I'm not happy with Wendell necessarily. I just don't think, I think we need to talk a little bit in the postseason show about like, is he the actual solution and is he a bad player? No, but is he what we need? If we truly think of ourselves as like a team that wants to win an actual title, I think we'll have to talk about it. Yeah, that's fair. Um, it, it definitely, now that the season's over, felt like he was kind of the barometer. That's the word I've used. It just felt like when he was playing at his peak, this team was really hard to beat. And then it never felt like he got back to that after he was out for a little while, right? Or was he out or was Zep out? Zep was Zep out. Zep was out. But I feel like teams figured Wendell out. And I yeah. don't, and the things they figured out about him are not things he'll ever be able to fix. And AKA, he's short. And then he also just can't – I mean, Jared was short too. We've had other short guys. McCormick was short. Sherry Cooper was short. But the situations that Wendell gets in, they didn't get in. The like, the te- like, rarely did we see teams get to abuse those other point guards down low. It's become a trend that not all the time, it's like two or three times a game, they find a way to work the ball into some sort of back down position on Wendell, and they almost always either score or Wendell fouls them. And also when Wendell fouls them, he does it so terribly, they almost always finish through him and get a foul call with the made two, which is another thing that happened tonight. And it's getting really bad to where it's like almost like going to give up a certain amount of points to the other team because it's going to happen. They're going to figure it out. And no, then two, no. there's this, this, this pit, the, the like, I need to find a good word for it because we're going to keep talking about it. When we lay the, the pick there, it's like a pick and roll. The two guys come up on him, his guard and the other guard come up on him. And it happens to every team. We've seen it to other teams and other teams have struggled with it too. But man, Wendell really struggles with it. He has to run away from it every time or gets stuck in there and our offense completely goes to trash. And I've yet to see maybe one time this game where it felt like we actually like did something productive out of that. Like, I don't know why you don't just do it every single time with him. And those are both like fatal flaws. You can't fix that. He can't pass over those two guys. You can't fix that. He's going to get back down. Like it's just not going to happen. Uh, the the size on defense is you're right. There's not really a fix to that other than having really good help defense to, to be there to, you know, help when he gets in trouble. Um, the offense thing, I do think that's fixable uh, with a lot of, I, I think, I thought you would come on this podcast a lot more coming in hot about how, uh, you know, we, we were very honest on this podcast about Auburn's offensive sets and philosophy and strength. And it really comes through in a game like this, where it's like, it's just not good when it's not good. It's not good. There's not a lot of stuff to redeem it, but there's ways to run that pick and roll in different spots on the floor where that's not going to be as big of a problem. And you saw one in the, at one point, Wendell split the defense beautifully. And we got right there because we had, we didn't put the screen and roll on the very wing where they can use the sideline as a third defender, you know, like, so that I think we can scheme around a little bit, but I, I, my only counterpoint to tonight, um, I thought Wendell did a lot of things that no one else was doing that we needed. Uh, he had some beautiful passes, led the team with five assists, um, he had half he's, not a, he's not a bad player. Like that's the issue. It'd be so much easier if he was just not good at other stuff. He's a baller. He's really good. I just, if you, he's not national championship good. He's not elite team good that we're going to need ultimately, in my opinion, that's what makes it so much tougher. And we've seen it in other sports and we see like those guys, they're not bad players. They're just not good. If you want to go that far, you just you can't ride that, that horse, you know? And he also, if I'm going to nitpick some more stuff, he just never stopped. Like we loved the logo threes at one point and now I absolutely hate them. And we figured out kind of a podcast or two ago that the reason why I loved and hated them is because when you're shooting those logo threes, when we're on a run, when we're doing well, they can be really a great exclamation point that like really can like, like secure that momentum. He's just gotten in such a bad habit of shooting those 
when we're in bad situations, like he's going to be the run stopper. And we know Jabari is the run stopper. And that's because he's so great at what he does. Wendell has made our runs, our bad runs, the other team's runs that much worse, that much more hurtful. Cause he will just will need that, a great shot. We need and He's the guy, he's going to have the ball in his hands and he goes up there and shoots an early shot clock logo three and absolutely like does like a six point swing on us. And he just has no feel or has not shown it in the last like 15 games or so of when to shoot that shot at this point, like the green light's gone. We're off the green light. We're barely on the yellow light anymore. Like it doesn't matter because the season's over, which freaking sucks. But like we are on like borderline red line on never shoot another one of those again. Like it's gotten, he doesn't make them hardly anymore. Like he made them in that like, final minutes of the sec tournament Texas A&M game but like he just has no feel he's a liability on that and we can talk about the scheme stuff too like I think you had a good point on that like part of like what makes him look so bad these end of regulation like end of halves and regulations because our schemes are so bad it's not necessarily like people are like ah freaking Wendell screwed up like there wasn't an offense (laughs) like we did not draw anything up that was actually going to work but he, he did make it worse by being short and not being able to get out of that kind of stuff so I don't know the, the scheme stuff. We, we need, we should talk about that too. in the postseason stuff. We never like question Bruce or anything. He's one of the greatest coaches in college basketball right now, but you have three assistants and you, one of those needs to be for a guy like Bruce. If you're, if it's kind of like some other sports too, like if you have a specialty, you got to have your assistants be whatever your like weakness is. And Bruce's biggest weakness is probably, and we can really admit this is the, sorry, we're both watching this TCU Arizona game. It's absolutely is- nuts. And I can't believe that. Did that just happen? No, it's it's not going to count. It's not going to count. Okay. I, I just listened to another podcast today where they did this and they were watching oh. a game commenting on it. And it was actually brutal to want, to listen to because they were watching like this Gonzaga and like kept bringing it up over and over again when we know the result. But uh, it's hard not to talk about this TCU Arizona game. But anyways, we need one of those three assistants to be a scheme guy. Like, how is one of those guys not the guy that Bruce can just turn to and be like, which play do we run? Teach these guys the plays. Like, I guess you only have so much time to practice with these guys and stuff, but, like, that's got to be a little tweak if you're going to tweak something in this offseason. There's got to be a little more variety in running plays when things get tough. Agreed. Um, I think the rub there, though, is – when you're a guy like Bruce, who's there's a crazy stat out there where his teams have been in the top two or three of scoring almost every year he's ever coached at every stop. Um, his so you change anything, yeah, yeah. His track record is so good. Like I'll just we'll we'll just look it up real quick while we're on here. Like I I agree. I, this has always been the challenge with Bruce. I think if you if you Which talk he to does people, drop really good stuff from the baseline under the goal on both sides on defense and offense. Yep. I just, whoever a third, I don't know who a third, I know we have West Wayne against Stephen Pearl. I guess the third guy is uh, maybe Chad Burgermaster Pruitt. or Chad Pruitt. Pruitt. And Do you think it's Chad Pruitt? I don't know. Like I know there's been a lot talking about it with, with the St. Peter's cause they don't pay their third guy. And supposedly it's the head coach and the three assistants are the ones that are allowed to recruit. So I, I don't know. We just Chad need, Pruitt's the third paid assistant. Is he? Yeah. yeah. We need, we need the, somebody on the sideline that can call these plays when times get tough, especially at the end well, of half, man. It's gotten yeah. so bad at the end of half. It's you know brutal. who's calling plays? Bruce is Did calling we have off. a single Bruce end of half calling. or end of regulation play that you felt good about all year in your mind right now? No, but but <laughs> look around college basketball. I, I just don't know. True. <laughs> it's been brutal to watch teams tied shoot contested threes with like 20 set, like having 20 seconds left to do something. And then they go and do nothing for the first 20, like 15 seconds of it. And then they just end up shooting contested three when all they needed was one point. So that, that's a big thing. Me and my friend Ryan talk about too. Shout out Ryan. He listened to the last podcast. So maybe he'll l- listen this deeply to this sad one too. I can't. We're looking up. Uh, I was gonna look up how many stats points per game, points per game we had this year. I do know, like it, it is tough to complain about Bruce when he's been so good for so long, and it's not really complaining about Bruce. It's just complaining about a situation we've had all year long. And we'll, and this will be a good conversation to start here, and we'll talk about all this stuff too at the big thing. But like, it just never felt like we learned from our mistakes all year long. We just kept pushing through them because we had a really good team. We had a really good team, and so we like it's hard to like really like go hard on these little mistakes, but. Charles Barkley called it out in the freaking Nebraska game 
in Atlanta that shot selection was going to be a huge issue that they could keep winning, but one day shot selection is going to bite us. It bought us a bunch of times and he was right. Like it's tough to like get on these teams when you're winning, but like, if you, you gotta, I don't know, you gotta, you gotta learn from your stuff. We just never did. We never learned. We never learned how to do these end of halves. We never learned how to do these in regulation. We never learned how to stop shooting bad volume from our guards. We never learned but, like a bunch of stuff. But here's the challenge. Nate, show me a Bruce Pearl team that's ever had good shot selection. Yeah. I just – I don't think I've ever seen one at Tennessee, at Auburn. Like, so, you know, I hate it, but it's just – I think we're kind of along for the ride here. I will say, um, I think it's worth pointing out, obviously this team didn't lose by more than five all year, you know, to anybody. They lost in double – so this is by far their biggest defeat. But even this game was just weird. Like, how in the world were we within – six or eight points like with 10 minutes to, to go or something like that it was it was insane really because like all the stats that we've talked about tonight were in play like they were happening in that moment it got uglier as the second half got to the bitter end but like I still don't know how this team even had a shot with how they played tonight but they did you know we're, we're kind of ranting around and like don't have really like a great process of how to like talk about this game I think we've given our piece at least as much as we want to without diving deeper into like yeah, the like legacy of this team and where players will be all you know, this stuff. I, part of the reason we, it's hard to talk about this stuff, we've only lost six games all year and we only talked about five of them <laughs> because one of those was in Atlantis. And so when we did like a debate. You, you missed two of them. Yeah, I missed two of them. We here. never really got in. I mean, that, I guess it's kind of like us as podcasters, us as the team. We never got into some sort of like routine of how to learn from these losses we just kind of like pushed through them like well that's a one-off thing or whatever so just like the team we never really decided how to talk about losses or what <laughs> to learn from each loss podcast of how to talk about them better so i'm just gonna say that's we'll start wrapping up probably not our best game. episode uh but 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 look i think this is a great reminder of this march thing is so much fun but when your team's in it and you have expectations that are real, it is brutal. Like, I feel like this year is the first year in my life that I really know, you know, 99, I was 10. I don't think I can count that. This, this makes me realize like, you know, Duke or like teams like that every year they get in and every team is trying to knock them off. And this, your whole season, your whole season is over just like that. You know, I was making plans for Chicago. By the way, Iowa State beat Wisconsin before our game. We were going to get to play Iowa State to go to the Elite Eight. Everything was falling our way. It and was. we just didn't do it. And uh, a lot of other teams aren't either. And uh, I, I will try to leave it on a little bit of a more positive note. We'll, we'll, talk, we'll look at the bracket real quick, too, and other SEC teams and some coach stuff real quick at the end. But uh, leave it on a little more positive note. It, it's such a crapshoot in March. We've never been in this position really yeah. to lose early with such expectations. Like you said, the only other time really was that one seed in 99. We just haven't been through this. And it really sucks that. So we've like, you're kind of like throwing a dice every time you get in these tournaments and every seed that you go up, you get better odds. Kind of if you're one seed and you throw that dice, you kind of have like a 50, 50, maybe like 25% chance or whatever to like do really well. Like, or like, throwing the dice like it's pretty rare role that you're going to do this badly we just hit the snake eyes on like a seven die like the if we had a seven a six die thing we hit the one you know like it, it really sucks and we've we've really had the opportunity to even hit that one you know we've had the five seed go all the final four yeah. so we we rolled really lucky on that one we needed a six and we rolled a six on that one the final four years so we got to like experience that yep. but we just experienced the opposite where you had a, a huge sheet and go down so early. And so my like positive note is that you kind of like in college basketball, the great coach, you're kind of just trying to like build enough great teams consistently that when you do roll that dice, eventually the odds are going to be in your favor that like, you're not going to hit the one this often. If you have a two, one seed, one seed, two seed with great players like this, the you're not going to hit a one very often. You're probably going to hit, the sixes and the fives and the fours and the threes. And those are good enough every time. And you're, if you hit a six with a great team like this, you're going to the national championship. It's so like, we have a great coach. We have great recruiting. We've established like this, the, the Neville's donating that money. So we'll talk more about this in the post thing. Like 
hopefully we're going forward to the future and we'll be able to toss that dice a couple more times. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a big opportunity and we, we missed this. One. You know, we, we, I think our fan base got a little weirded out. You know, everybody just forgave the 18 team for losing the second round because they were out of gas and they didn't have starters and you just knew they weren't quite. We were just happy to make tournament first time. Yeah. First time in 15 years. And then you had that incredible, what everybody should realize by now, like that is a historic all time run that Auburn went on as a five seed to go through the teams they went through and arguably get robbed or make a mistake at the end of like being a potential net. Like that was crazy. Like that's not normal. And I would argue what's more normal is you know, all the, all, all the great season buys you is better odds early. Like, that, that's all it does. It, it bought us a game to try to get some stuff figured out that clearly didn't work. And, you know, you saw Baylor go down. You saw Kentucky go down as a two. You know, we go down in the first weekend as a two. Tennessee was as hot as anybody. They go down. It happens to everybody. And I just think the next step for us is, first of all, to be in. You, you've always been on top of a great – it's so rare in college basketball for you to be a team that makes it four straight years. You know, we were going to have three when COVID kind of messed it up, but last year we didn't make it. Now you can blame Sharif and the NCAA, but we just weren't good enough last year. This is one. So let's keep making the tournament in a competitive sec. And then the, the next step, if you, if you listen to really experienced college basketball people, if you get to a lot of sweet 16s, you're a dang good coach and program like that is hard to do. You're seeing it this year with a lot of the teams getting knocked out. If Bruce can kind of, obviously we've only done that once now with Bruce in eight years, we've made the tournament three times and we've made two second rounds and uh, one final four. So like, can you get to that second weekend more frequently? And you can do that as any seed, right? You're seeing 10 seed, 11 seed, like get in the dance, get hot, know who you are. And you can make you can do some damage. Um, so look, it's great to have a top seed. You said it's the one of the worst losses. The reason I'll close with this, one of my last thoughts. The reason this feels like such a choke and such a terrible game is because we accomplished something for only the second time in our basketball history. But we put ourselves in our position to choke, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like it wouldn't be a choke if it was a six five matchup or something like that and we just got beat it, but because Auburn had the target because we had that number one you know number one for the first time 19 game winning streak uh, SEC regular season champ when it, a year when everybody thought the SEC was really good which we can debate that now um yeah. anyway that that's a lot but I think the reason it feels so bad is because of how good this season was and going back to my original thought the thing that just is sitting with me tonight is I hate that this is going to be the, the, the image, the two hour window that a lot of people out will we'll always appreciate this team. You and I were there to watch them cut down the nets. This is always going to be a special team with some awesome memories and some great players, no matter what it looks like next year. But I just hate that this is going to be the lasting thing about this team for a lot of people. Yeah. That's March, baby. That's March. It is. But this is a good time to talk about, uh, we told the SEC six teams made the tournament, right? Yeah. Six teams. There's one left. We and lost. The only team left is Arkansas in the Sweet 16 against number one Gonzaga. And, and Arkansas only insane. got there. They, Arkansas beat Vermont a 13 seed and New Mexico State a 12. Seed. So, like, they, you know. Is the SEC bad, Matt? Is the SEC did. bad? Were we tricking ourselves all year? We, we were complimenting ourselves on winning this, the, one of the toughest leagues in the country. And, you know, I know people hate the big, big 10 had a really bad tournament last year, but the big 10 has looked really good this year. And this year's turn. the big 12 has looked really good. The ACC all of a sudden, you know, Notre Dame played really well. Miami obviously has played well. Duke's still in, um, you know, it's just crazy. Bizarre, Bizarre it's, man. man. Now it's the, it's the only thing that soothes this like wound a little bit because we like kind of compare ourselves to the other, these other teams, these Tennessees and Alabamas and Kentuckys that we need to like for recruiting purposes and like funding purposes and like narrative purposes, we need them to stay down and we need to be up or whatever. And so this would have been an absolutely, it still is absolutely brutal loss or whatever, but like the fact that Alabama didn't make any noise all year long and anything really 
And Kentucky went down so early, they can't say anything. And then Tennessee went down so early, they can't say anything. Like, we're all going to have to, like, just be mutually looking at each other like, well, crap. <laughs> like, no one can smack talk, you know? What a missed opportunity, though. I mean, yeah. this could have been – this could have been our – really a chance to, like, big three here. Oh, missed. Uh, Arkansas, <laughs> Arkansas. Arkansas still has that opportunity, and it will be – that. this is why we'll do a podcast after the tournament's yeah. over and really do a big picture – kind of thing because Arkansas could go out there and beat Gonzaga and yep. go elite eight. And then all of a sudden Arkansas, as much as you saw that atmosphere when we played them as number one and their fans really believe that they are a basketball school and they yep. have been since the nineties. And they're just been like laying dormant until they finally had a good coach. I mean, it'd been 20 plus years since they made a sweet 16 until last year. So I don't, I don't always buy in and all this basketball school nods. I think they had a great era in the early 90s, and then that's really it. They're not a basketball school, but mainly day this year, this like, idea from the national media that were kids or whatever in the 90s or teenagers in the 90s, they're going to start calling Arkansas basketball school. It's yep. basketball first, and they'll be doing the same kind of stuff that we were doing this year, and they are already recruiting very well, yep. and Musselman's got this, got a certain amount of cachet in the national media, it seems, that yep. Bruce Pearl never is going to get because everyone seems to hate Bruce for some reason, but so it's dangerous. Let's hope that Arkansas <laughs> loses to Gonzaga as much as that, like, if you want your friend's bracket to be busted or whatever, but, like, Screw it. I, I hope everyone that listens to this podcast brag is already busted, though. you got to believe in your team. Before. I I put Auburn all the way, so it sucks for me. Well, I had Arizona all the way, and so that's why I'm so invested right now in this uh, Arizona game. But you're, you're right. Uh, we the, the, the great irony in this, we, I completely agree with you. The reason this doesn't hurt worse is because our main competition did worse than us, basically, in every way, you know. Um, or at least the same. So, but it's a huge missed opportunity for us. Um, I really think Sweet 16s matter as much as Final Fours get a lot of attention. I think getting into that second weekend is so difficult. And it really felt like this team b- belonged at least in the Sweet 16. I mean, I, I was never Final Four bust necessarily just because I know how hard that is. But I just, man, I was just hoping we could get out of this first weekend and figure it out. No, but no one says made round of 32. Or like they say that should made the tournament, but that is like a low bar for like if you want to be a big national thing or whatever. But Sweet 16, people throw that in your little stat line. Yep. Like, oh, Bruce Pearl, what a great coach. She sent them to the Final Four, and he's won the SEC this many times, and he's been to this many Sweet 16s and one Elite Eight and two Final Four, whatever, you know. But, but like they don't they don't throw in the made this many tournaments usually, you know. You remember all our banners at the top of Neville Arena, though. There is one for the round of 32 that it will get to add. And, and when we were there sitting in the stadium, I looked around. There are entirely too many banners in the stadium, honestly. <laughs> they need to, like, like make – I mean, you don't have to necessarily remove anything, but you need to make some smaller. You need to combine a couple of them. And part of the reason I said that is because I assumed that this year we'd – we are adding at least one, the SEC regular season, which is great. Yeah. But I was hoping we might add another one in there. And we need to like consolidate. It's hopefully, hopefully in the future we'll keep doing enough things that where we need to consolidate some of those banners. Right now it's a little, little busy, guys. Let me know. Let me. I'll redesign it, guys. Let me know. <laughs> By the way, thank goodness, right? Thank goodness we won the SEC all to ourselves. Yeah. Like we said it all year. You can't rely. You know, you just don't know what's going to happen in tournament season. It was very kind to us three years ago, but um, you just don't know. And and this is why, like. This is going to sting for a long time. This one will hurt. It, it's the, it's, it just really stinks that that's the last time we're going to see Jabari in an Auburn uniform, and that's how he's going to go out. But ultimately, Auburn's going to go into next year as the defending SEC champions, and uh, who knows what that team will look like. We'll have all offseason to kind of look at what's going to happen and think about that. But, you know, it, it's a good year, but the, the sad part of – it's crazy. Somebody, it's, this is obvious math, but somebody talked about the tournament. You know, the craziest thing about the tournament is you go from 68 teams to 16 teams in this one little four day stretch. Like, isn't that crazy? Like yeah. 48 teams get their hopes and dreams dashed in four days. That's what makes this weekend so great. But when it's your team, man, it is, uh, it's brutal. Is there, is there any SEC coaching news? I know Mississippi state hired the New Mexico state coach so if you just oh. watch the Arkansas New Mexico State game like the next day after our New Mexico State went down uh, Mississippi State went and hired that guy I think South Carolina is still open Florida then, Florida hired a former Auburn Bruce guy Todd Golden who was at um, 
San Francisco. They had a really good year, made the tournament. That's who Florida went with. South Carolina, I didn't know that. So everybody say, speaks super highly of that coach. So, of course. That oh, was- yeah, they do. It was annoying. I was going to bring that up, that it was annoying me that, that one of those guys that's on the set with Charles Barkley, they were talking about Mike K, of course, and they were talking about who can, like, take up his mantle. And they are talking about Jay Wright at Villanova is, like, taking up Mike K's mantle kind of. If, if Villanova can pull it off this year, then, yeah, you can kind of say that, like, maybe. But he's also a little older, you know, like the guy was, like, one of the guys on the set, they were naming a couple other big guys. I was hoping they'd bring up Bruce maybe, but I think part of this Bruce Lord, but like they're definitely not now going to bring him up. Like, I feel like this was like a now or never a little bit for Bruce to be like the guy. Now it's going to have to be a guy, you know, honestly, just because of his age. And uh, one of the guys on the set was like, Oh, but I want to go a little younger. Like some of these guys, they can bring up, you know, that guy from San Francisco this year and this other mid major guy. And then it was like every freaking year, there's a couple of hot mid-major guys, just like in other sports, and they get hired by the big schools, and then like one out of ten of them actually like stick around at that school for any meaningful amount of time, and then one out of a hundred of them become a great coach. So like I just thought it was so dumb that this guy was like maybe this guy, the hot mid-major guy, you know, like maybe Todd Grunt is amazing at Florida, and we like eat our words, or I do, and it sucks to play against them every year, but I just it's always a bit of a gamble with these mid-major guys about which one's actually going to translate into some great coach. It is, but this guy has a long track record. He obviously uh, beat, really had us beat. In the, well, I shouldn't say that. He he played a really, he coached a really good game against us in the first round three years ago when we made the final four run, almost beat us. He, who was he, the Mexico State guy? Yep, same coach. And then He's he went to San Francisco after that? No, the, the, that guy went to Florida. Todd Golden. That's what I'm saying. That's who I'm talking about is Todd Golden the whole time. Oh, That's I thought you were talking about the Scott Jantz. Uh, no, Todd Golden, that's what I was talking about. The same oh, guy. Golden. That's the guy on the online thing called the, – the, any of these – he named two or three other guys that were mid-major guys or whatever. But yeah, We'll see about that. Yeah, what's, what's the big thing talking about? So he went to say he was San Francisco coach. Why is he so respected? I know he they did well at the Dons. Shout out to my friend Jimmy. He works for the Dons as an athletic trainer. Not that he's ever going to listen this deep in a podcast because he's a bammer. <laughs> so <laughs> – uh, that's interesting. We'll, we'll have to see what happens. But uh, somebody should be scared about with him. Why? Why am I? Why is he nothing? You know, you just know I about the Mexico State guy. I, and I, he he was with Bruce. He has he's a uh, he he I believe was an Israeli American uh, part of their little federation or their one of their teams. And there's some connections. There was a good, was a good tweet out there. Not to get too controversial about <laughs> wanting to beat uh, Miami so bad that Bruce Pearl could be tweeting about Iranian missiles halfway through the game. Because he's got like a weird – Bruce has a really weird Twitter presence that's not, uh, in my opinion, the greatest for Auburn basketball recruiting or any kind of like – I don't know. He can do whatever he wants with himself. So I, I think he's recruiting okay. Yeah, he's it's clearly not impacting anything. So, And I know my, my opinions don't always match uh, love the Auburn fan base. <laughs> but that, that's coaching news for SEC stuff. That's bracket stuff. I mean – we're ranting a little bit. Uh, we, we just we need to cut this off. I think we need to we need to take a breather. Thank yeah. you guys for listening. And uh, you know, it's this is a tough one. There's no getting around it. Really disappointing, just in a lot of facets, like we've t- discussed. I think we, everybody just really loved this team. I think big. The last thing I would say is just you know the the sucky part is we won't get to see this team again in this form. And uh, it's been obviously so much fun this year they've been a great team to follow we've been lucky with this podcast to have so many fun games to talk about a long winning streak a historic season in many ways for Auburn but man just really uh in the moment it puts a big damper on it to to end this way we'll we'll for sure have a podcast at the end of the NCAA tournament to talk about some big picture stuff and me and Matt off to talk about what we want to do in the off season and next season so so things just like the team might change a bit the podcast like format or what we'll figure out what we want to do with it. And I, we, you know, we've got a, a, it's really grown a ton. I mean, from the, you know, we've, we've probably leveled off a little bit on, on stuff throughout the season on, and I, like there's only so many Auburn basketball fans out there or whatever, but I don't know, like we'll have to talk about it. We'll throw some stuff out there on the socials and we'll ask amongst our friends that we know, listen and things like what they want in the off season, how like, if people really like, we like to think that this, this year in, in general, Auburn basketball has established itself enough to, to need an off season podcast to talk about this kind of stuff that's going on with the team and what's going on, but maybe not. I don't know. We'll have to like ask out there and see what the listenership's like on maybe one of our off season with like 
we've been doing interviews. We love it. It's so cool for us to be able to like talk to these people that we got to watch and are big fans of and stuff. But you know, if people aren't interested. We probably won't do it. So we'll see if yeah, you know, we built we built this thing around reacting to the games and having a good you know banter about what's just happened. And I think it's been really like you said at the beginning, you know, it's something we would do anyway on the phone, probably most games. We just kind of made it a little more official, a little more work. And um, I think that has been a good niche for us to find. There's not a lot coming out right after the game. This will probably be the first thing out on podcasts about Auburn We've basketball. We've beaten one time all year to get our podcast out for anybody else. Not that it was necessarily something we were like absolutely trying to do. It just always seem to happen and I think we understand now why it doesn't because it's kind of exhausting to do this every single time but yeah last game was the first time all year that I refreshed my podcast feed and there was another Auburn podcast in front of it and I think like you're you were getting to a little bit we have a little bit of a niche on like doing the post game thing and being fans covering it pretty much all the other podcasts out there are beat writers and people that are getting paid to do it we don't get paid to do this or anything like that it's just two guys having a good time and so they do it like once a week. And the re, a big, the biggest reason we probably do the buys, we want some, it was just for basketball. This team's too good. Yeah. This program's too good to share with everybody else. Like all the, there's a ton of just F word podcasts and like that happen to cover basketball at the end of it for 10 minutes. We wanted a real thing. So well, you know, throw it out there and let us know if you're, if you listen this long, please message us, please email us, please, whatever, find us. And tell us that you want this in the off season and you want to hear some recruiting news or whatever, you know. My personal opinion, and we'll like I like you said, I think we need to see what the list is. I, I I will just say from my years of experience as a big Auburn basketball fan, um, we are severely lacking in year-round coverage in basketball in our traditional mediums. Let's just put it that way. All the paid sites, all that is very underwhelming. Uh, mostly there's some people who do decent stuff, but that's why we did this. I, I still think there's going to be a market for it, especially the way this ended. I don't see major entities, you know, changing their approach. Maybe if Auburn had won the national championship or gone to another final four or something. Um, but I still think, I think there's a market out there. I think people are so hungry. There's something about college basketball that's just fun and there's another sport out there that dominates the, the uh, opinions, uh, the, the, all the focus that isn't always fun right now. It's just very stressful. It's very overwhelming. The changes, I think, are even worse for the sport that we talk about in college athletics. I think people are, especially with Bruce and what he's built, people are drawn to this. Like People are really enjoying Auburn basketball. And I think hopefully in some small way we can, like you said, maybe it changes a little bit, but... I think, I think there's something here, you know, and I think our numbers kind of dictate that. Yeah. So I think we'll try, we'll try to do something. We'll, we'll, we'll talk it more out in this big postseason show. So guys, thanks for a great season. Thanks for listening along. We had a good time doing all this and made some friends and interviewed some cool people. And uh, we're just dragging it out because I'm a little sad. <laughs> it's over <laughs> we'll, we'll have like like jackson said four times we'll have another one after the tournament's over ben young had reached out we were going to do a sweet 16 preview we were going to have all these great things but uh this is how it malik, goes man we, we, we there was a chance malik dunbar was going to come on <laughs> if this was a win it was like a whole thing uh, uh, we well, still have some more interview we might check out what sunny and uh what sunny might be up to in the off season. i think he would be a good conversation no matter what and uh Yep. Maybe see what Marlene's up to. I'd love to get back with Marlene and see if uh, what her expectations were pre-season as the director of communications and see what it was like as a full ride at the end, you know? So we will catch up with some people. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll, we'll see. This has been so fun. Um, you know, it, it this one will hurt for a while, but we really did have a blast getting to, I'm glad you and I got to go to a game in Auburn Arena and, and see us win the SEC and, um just the it's been awesome we'll talk more in our next episode uh it's just been so cool for us personally just some of the things we've gotten to do this year and people we've gotten to talk to uh that's made it worth it but then just the fact that we've met people and talked to people who have actually listened <laughs> and, and enjoyed it and listened to it on the way to greenville to the first round ncaa tournament like that stuff's really cool so we've enjoyed that um 
bunch of the Auburn Twitter people have been good to us, even though Jackson and I are not great uh, Twitter users, but it's been fun. It all works. Can't figure it out. <laughs> you know what? And, and I guess we have one team we can still root for in the NCAA tournament, the St. Peter's Peacocks. Let's go. <laughs> I have my I keep, keep an eye out for me. I might be at their student section thing next Friday or Thursday. I almost went uh, yesterday. You, it's 45 minutes from my apartment. I was so close to trying to get a friend to go with me and like sneak in and be on TV. But anyways, Bruce, we love you. I still got your signature up over here. War Eagle, Matt. It was a good time. War Eagle. We'll talk to you all in a couple of weeks.